Hi, I'm the Highway Groupie. In this video, we're going to be testing this uh, Hotec uh, microphone system. It's an H-U25. H-U25 microphone, microphone system. There are two mics uh, that we're using here. Anyway, we're going to start with the unboxing, and then we're going to get into an in-depth review of this uh, microphone system. All right, so let's start with the unboxing of the Hotec U, sorry, the H-U25. Now the H-U05 has one transmitter. This one has two, so it is the U25. So let's see how it unboxes. First thing we get is a thank you card. Very nice, you're welcome. And their instruction manual, which is very pictorial, as we can see in the paperwork here. It's a very pictorial uh, manual. And it does give the essential information, how to hook up to your smartphone, how to hook up to an amplifier, how to hook up to your camera. So we'll get to play with that. Now let's see what's in the box. First of all, let's start with the transmitters. And the transmitters have these little flexible antennas. So that's uh, neat. There's transmitter number two. And we have the receiver, also with a little flexible antenna. And it comes with a a mono phono jack mono phono jack so that means that the output is going to be monaural you won't be able to get stereo out of these even though you have two transmitters you have the cradle now the cradle fits onto a variety of things it has its own little uh, cold shoe mount I think you'll find that the cold shoe mount just barely fits into your cold shoe it's really right at the edge uh, I find that it does not fit in my cold shoe. The cold shoe on my camera it sits in a little well, and this one is just a little bit too long for that. But then, once you put it on, you just lock it into place. So you can lock it in relation to this if you want it uh, sideways or whatever. And then, once it's in the camera, then you lock it down with this little a screw here. The fact that it comes with this little, uh, this small screw here is actually compatible with any microphone boom that uh, has this kind of small uh, input here. So as we can see, we can just put it into the boom. A lot of booms have these small screw mounts and then they give you an adapter for the wider screw mounts for your microphone holder. So this can actually go on a variety of things. I have it on my little stand here. You can use this to as a support as well if you're going into a smartphone or something and you want to be able to stand it up rather than leaving sitting on the counter. So that's the cradle and the cold shoe. Now let's find out what are in the bags. This is a neat little device. I've had this with other uh, microphone systems that have two transmitters and a receiver. It's actually a single single USB connector to a triple USB B connector. So the one I had before, it only worked once and then it didn't work anymore. Hopefully this will be a little better quality. Anyway, so you'll need to charge it with this and it makes it handy. You can use one connector to charge all three units. The units use uh, a battery that's based on aluminum which makes the battery a little bit lighter. The units are quite light, but we'll get into that into the in-depth review a little later on. Uh, what else do we have here? We have the Lavalier microphones. If you look at the cover of the box, it mentions that uh, it is with the Lavalier microphones and also headsets. We'll get into that in a second. So here's your Lavalier mic. We're going to be doing in-depth testing of the sound quality of this microphone. So there's one, and it comes with a little pop screen, as you can see. There's the 
the other one. Staying with the subject of microphones, we have a headset. And a lot of headsets come standard to the, you put the microphone boom on your left hand side. This one is designed the other way around. So you actually have the boom and you have an earpiece here. Anyway, so there's your, uh, and it also has a mono eighth inch connector. So there's your microphone to get a view of what the, this microphone, we know what a lavalier microphone looks like. This is just a regular uh, headset microphone. So we can see that this regular unit, it has supposedly unidirectional, but we will be testing that as well in the in-depth review if it's unidirectional or omnidirectional. So we'll see if it has the cardioid effect or not. So we have two of these. There's one. And here's the other one. Okay. The only other thing in the box, a TRS, the TRS uh, connector that goes to the phono plug. So this goes into the receiver and adapts this for your uh, DSLR camera or it'll adapt to your computer. So that's the, that plug. Then you have the TRRS for your smartphone or whatever. And again, to the mono plug. So this is strictly microphone into your camera, into your uh, computer and into your uh, smartphone and either one of the adapters. There is not a two way. You cannot hear at the same time. Okay, so that's basically the unboxing. Now let's get into the test of the equipment. At this point in the video, let's do the distance test. Now I have the uh, receiver set up on my uh, Canon camera over there. And uh, attached to it, I have the headset with the transmitter behind my back. So the transmitter is going through my body at this point. I also have a lapel mic with the transmitter here on my hip. So the transmitter is in a clear sight of vision between it and the receiver. I also have a mount, a microphone, just in case as I do the distance test, the sound drops off, at least I'll know where I am. Okay, so let's start the distance test. We're at five meters from the camera right now. I'm going to end up at 100 meters from the camera way down at the other end of the parking lot. This cans Vincent Trente Trente Quarante Quarante Cinquante 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, 100 meters. So, I don't know how many people are actually going to be filming 100 meters away from their microphone, but just in case they are, we'll see how this works. So now I'm going to return to you, and this time the lapel microphone is facing you. The headset microphone is in behind me, so it's broadcasting through my body. Now, these microphones are not stereo. The only way that we'll be able to tell which one dropped out is perhaps if there's a difference in sound quality between the two mics, then uh, we'll be able to tell. These do not come with uh, windscreens, so I'm not using them with windscreens. I didn't take one out of inventory, including the Maono microphone. 
So, fortunately, there's not a lot of wind today, so maybe we'll get away with it. Now, we should be, hopefully, within range of the receiver by now. And coming back to five meters again, and there is our distance test. So now let's do an in-depth of this uh, microphone system. Now for a list and explanation of our tests in this review, I encourage you to look at my comments below. I don't want to list them here and take up uh, a lot of your time. Uh, I also give the timestamp so that you can go directly to any specific test that you want. So first of all, for the overall look and feel, they seem quite rugged. If we look at the uh, casing here, it's got a metal casing. They seem to be able to take a bit of abuse. They uh, have the flexible antennas, metal jackets. I found that there is a lack of proper shielding, however, in these units, so you'll see more why a little later. But basically, if I touch the uh, microphone, if I touch the microphone itself, or if I touch the wire to the microphone, or if I touch the transmitter, then it uh, picks up a lot of static. So the company really needs to look into this. Uh, the on-off switches are sufficiently difficult to get to in order to make it hard for these to be turned on or off accidentally. So we can see, if I, well, let me put it this way here. So just hitting it once takes you to, it shows you the frequency that it's broadcasting on. And then uh, these little arrows here will change your volume level. Now if you're using the headset, you'll find that around 10 or 11 is good. If you're using the lapel mic, such as I'm using here, then you'll find that you will need to set it at about 20, unless you change for a better quality uh, the pal mic, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, sometimes, especially for the receiver, which is on the camera, so I can't really show it to you, but the receiver button is a little bit difficult. You need a good fingernail to uh, turn it on and off. And turning it, uh, once it's um, on for a little bit, when it gets to that point, it'll only show the battery level. When it gets to this point, then you have to hit the button once and then a second time in order to shut it off. Not really an inconvenience, but you do need to know that ahead of time. And then of course it has the uh, USB-C connector on the bottom. It's on the bottom of the transmitters, it's on the top of the uh, receiver. So other than the uh, band frequency and the volume level, it also shows you the uh, antenna level whether you're getting a good signal from your transmitter or from the receiver to the transmitter or not. Now I found that the receiver will heat up considerably when running. It will heat to about 40 degrees Celsius or roughly 105 degrees Fahrenheit. That's very hot for a small battery operated unit. Um, nevertheless, it doesn't seem to get any hotter than that and it doesn't seem to cause any damage. The so-called Lavalier microphones as you can see here, they're very large. If I compare them to the uh, little, the real Lavalier microphones, I call these lapel mics because I have a hard time calling these Lavalier. Um, you can see that they're about five times bigger than the uh, standard Lavalier mics. The mic cables are not long enough to stretch from below the bustle, uh, for example, in a wedding dress, to the neckline. They're only just a little less than a meter or roughly three feet long. Other competitors' uh, cables are usually about 1.2 meters or roughly four feet. So that when placed on a belt, uh, the longer cable does become a bit of a liability. Uh, however, um, you can deal with that. You can't deal with a short cable unless you put an extender. So just uh, the look and feel of the uh, units and the headsets, which are rather uncomfortable. You can see the set itself. So I gave an overall 
of 7 out of 10. Now, the transmitter weighs 63 grams or about 2.2 ounces. This uh, should not be too much when clipped to a belt or a bustle. Uh, the receiver weighs 39 grams or about 1.4 ounces. So definitely not a handicap on your camera. So these get a 9.5 out of 10 for uh, weight. The included accessories are adequate. There is no uh, TRS to XLR or Phono to XLR because this actually has a Phono as the original uh, plug. They do have the uh, Phono to TRS and the Phono to TRRS. So that's okay. That uh, gets you to your cell phone. And the Phono plug is actually compatible with a lot of um, uh, amplifiers. Now the uh, included uh, pop screens, so you can see them here and here, they're adequate. Uh, basically uh, standard. There's no carrying kit as we would find with many competitors. So from uh, the accessories point of view, I give it a six out of 10. Now these are powered by internal 650 milliamp aluminum batteries. Uh, I managed to get between four and six hours of use out of them. I never really have run it right down to zero. So I don't know exactly how long they would last, but definitely you will get four to six hours out of a charge. The advantage, of course, is the cost of these to run is minimal with uh, charging batteries all the time. The disadvantage is that you cannot uh, swap batteries in the field. You have to recharge. However, at the price that they're selling these units, you can buy a whole second unit for the cost of about uh, 10, AA, 10 sets of AA batteries if you compare with those systems who use the uh, AA's or even the 9 volt batteries which are even more expensive. Uh, given that there's no perfect solution for every field use of this type of, type of system, I'm giving this an 8 out of 10 for the power supply. Concerning line noise, uh, what we see here is the camera with a dummy plug. As you can see, the noise generated is negligible. With the receiver only, uh, that is, no microphones uh, turned on, we can see that there is also an insignificant increase in the line noise. So from the receiver to the camera, there is very little line noise. With the microphone turned on, the line noise picks up by 10 decibels in the 35 hertz range. At 70 uh, hertz, there is a huge increase of 35 decibels over the uh, uh, camera. So this is very audible. The increase drops to about 20 decibels at 140 hertz, and then levels off at about uh, uh, 10 to 15 decibels between 281 and uh, 2 kilohertz. At 4 kilohertz, all the way up to 18 kilohertz, the gain in noise grows to nearly 20 decibels. So this graphic represents an audible hum in the low range for sure. Let's compare the noise, uh, the line noise, to the recording of the white noise. Now the greatest loss is in the 17 to 35 range, where there is only a 15 uh, decibel difference between the line noise and what's being recorded. Uh, we can ignore this more or less because the 7 to 30, 17 to 35 range is really more felt than uh, heard, although it does help to round things out. At 70 to 140 hertz range, the difference between line noise and recorded sound is only 10 decibels on average. This is not good. Uh, for music, this would cancel out the bass drum and the bass guitar. At uh, 281 to 1 kilohertz, which is the general voice range, it improves to around 30 decibels. This would allow for sufficient recording of both a woman's and a man's voice. At the 2 kilohertz to 4 kilohertz range, the difference improves to um, 45 decibels on average. This is quite good for these small microphones and should give you some clarity in voice reproduction, if not a little too much. 
At the 9 kilohertz, the difference spikes to an average of 55 decibels. This will add more clarity, but it will also add way too much treble, given the weakness, especially in the low end of these microphones. In the 18 kilohertz, the difference returns to an average of around 35 decibels, very near the difference of the 281 to 4K range. So I give this a 5 out of 10 for a line noise because there, there is quite a bit of noise in, uh, in the background. Because of the line noise, it took me a long time to be able to make this test as these units are very poorly shielded. If I touch a microphone, I don't mean touching this part, just even touching this part or touching the cable of the microphone, or if I touch the transmitter itself, uh, the line noise goes crazy. It just shoots way up. The problem can be reduced by connecting a better microphone to the system. For example, the level of microphone that I showed you earlier. Uh, the line noise does go down, but it's not eliminated as the transmitter still senses my presence. So, even if I put a better microphone in, if I happen to touch the casing, then uh, the line noise does increase. So on the less on the um, on the better Lavalier microphone, if I touch the cable, it doesn't react at all. Only if I touch the transmitter. I had to make sure that neither I nor my test equipment became a source of line noise, and that was not easy. Uh, when wearing the equipment, it does not seem to affect to a great degree, but I would still like to see them improve the shielding on this uh, system. On the comparison of the white noise, I gave the lapel mic a 6 out of 10, as the uh, line is only flat from 70 hertz to 4 kilohertz. In the 17 to 35, it is non-existent, and there is a huge spike at the 9K. So I'm giving this, as I say, a 6 out of 10. The headset, on the other hand, and of course I'm doing all of these tests without the pop screen, just like this and just like this. So the headset shows a steady increase from 281 to 4 kilohertz and then spikes at 9 kilohertz. This makes the sound it records very thin and very tinny. So I'm only giving it a 5.5 out of 10. And the reason, the only reason I'm giving it that much is because normally we use the headset only for voice. So it's still, you can make up what's being said, but you do sort of sound like a telephone operator. The white Gaussian noise should show a slight increase from left to right on the, on the graphic here. However, what we find is a drop from 70 to 140, then a sharp increase to two kilohertz. There's a slight drop at uh, 4 kilohertz and then a spike at 9 kilohertz, which we now expect from this microphone, as we've seen earlier. At the 18 kilohertz, it drops uh, off sharply. So for the white Gaussian noise, I only gave it a 5 out of 10. The headset did a little better in the 9 kilohertz to 18 kilohertz range, but otherwise it paralleled the lapel mic. On the pink noise test, both the headset and the lapel mics did very, very poorly. Rather than a d declining line, as we should see, we see a flat line plus the usual spike at the 9 kilohertz. This would uh, reproduce very thin sound, so I gave them a 4 out of 10 for the pink noise test. So let's uh, move on to the test to help us to see what all of this means for us. So what we're going to do first is listen to a digital recording of uh, Zonoma. Uh, it's from the piece, uh, Don't Let Me Down. The, and what we're going to hear first is the way it should be listened to. When out of time, I really thought you were on my side. But now there's nobody by my side. I need you, I need you, I need you right now. Yeah, I need you right now. Now let's listen to how the lapel mic heard this same uh, sample. This 
Zonoma's voice is tolerable. However, there is that huge spike in the 9 kilohertz that adds way too much treble. And the lack of response in the 17 to 70 range uh, takes away from the bass and the drum. So I give this uh, for the woman's voice about uh, 6 out of 10. Even though it's music here, we are looking for good uh, quality reproduction from at least 280 to about uh, 4 kilohertz. Now, here is the way the headset heard this uh, piece. We are still picking up a lot of line noise despite many precautions I took to avoid it. Also, the response range is pushed into the 562 to 9 kilohertz range, making this sound very thin and not very appropriate for a woman's voice. Now, moving on, Rod Beatty has a voice that sits uh, more in the 562 range. So let's listen to his portrayal of Walt Wingfield in an excerpt taken, taken from letters from Wingfield Farm. Very amusing. You may want to look this up on YouTube. I left the office early today and caught the train out of the city back to Larkspur. Maggie had a dinner meeting of the Women's Institute to get ready for, and she was expecting me home to do chores. It used to bother me that the whole train had to be stopped in Larkspur just to let me off. Then it carried on up to Port Petunia before going back to the city. Tonight, as soon as I stepped off, it shifted gears and chugged back the way it came. I think if I stop riding this train, we won't have one. <laughs> now, let's see how the lapel mic heard this same recording. I left the office early today and caught the train out of the city back to Larkspur. Maggie had a dinner meeting of the Women's Institute to get ready for, and she was expecting me home to do chores. It used to bother me that the whole train had to be stopped in Larkspur just to let me off. Then it carried on up to Port Petunia before going back to the city. Tonight, as soon as I stepped off, it shifted gears and chugged back the way it came. I think if I stop riding this train, we won't have one. <laughs> so Rod's voice is in the intelligible range, although his S's and T's are more pronounced and we lose a lot of the depth of his voice. Also, the line, line noise is clearly audible. For fun, I cut uh, eight decibels out of the six kilohertz and 15 decibels out of the 1.6 kilohertz to see how it would sound. By reducing that end of the spectrum, it sounded more palatable. This is not always possible when going live, but can be done when using post-production. So I give it a five out of 10 for a man's voice. Now let's see how the headset picked this up. I left the office early today and caught the train out of the city back to Larkspur. Maggie had a dinner meeting of the Women's Institute to get ready for and she was expecting me home to do chores. It used to bother me that the whole train had to be stopped in Larkspur just to let me off, then it carried on up to Port Petunia before going back to the city. Tonight, as soon as I stepped off, it shifted gears and chugged back the way it came. I think if I stop riding this train, we won't have one. <laughs> As you can hear, Rod's voice gets stuffed into the, uh, well, beyond the 562 range, into the 9 kilohertz range. Uh, because of the line noise, it is impossible to pick up anything below that range. When I did the same reduction in the 6 kilohertz to, and uh, 1.6 kilohertz, uh, that is reducing it by 8 and 15, he sounded like he was uh, talking through a surgical mask. So for the headset, I gave it only a 3 out of 10 for a man's voice. For the instrumental test, uh, we turn to a little jazz from a tune called Julie's Place. This is what the digital output should sound like. Now, let's listen to what the lapel mic heard. Uh, 
As you can hear, the bottom falls out of this when applying the same 6 kilohertz and 1.6 kilohertz filters as before. It improves some, but there's still no, no depth to it. Much like those, so those old microphones, maybe you remember those that, uh, if you're as old as I am anyway, <laughs> they were included for free in the $20 cassette record players back in the 1970s. That sort of puts me in mind of that. So I give it a five out of 10 for uh, music. Now, not that we would use a, head f a headset for something like music, but let's give it a go anyway. This is what it hears. So basically the music is recognizable, but that is about uh, all one could say. Three out of 10. Just for the fun of it, I connected the uh, better quality lapel mic, uh, that is the real uh, Lavalier mic, to the system. And this is the result. I think you'll find this interesting. Now you'll notice that the line noise is reduced considerably and the music is much easier to listen to. The mic sensitivity is also much higher, roughly double that of the uh, um, supplied microphones with the Hotec system. The reason I say that is I had to double the volume of the recording in order for us to, be, to uh, be able to compare, whereas I did not have to do that with this microphone. By tweaking the 6 kilohertz and 1.6 kilohertz to minus 4 and minus 8 decibels respectively, it became almost a faithful recording. Therefore, the transmitter or receiver, or both, still pump a little too much into the 9 kilohertz range, and the mics are responsible, responsible for the rest in that range, or at least 50% uh, of the line noise, if not more. Uh, so. Anyway, we'll get back to this point a little later on. Now, I was not able to perform the latency test because these mics record only in monaural. Uh, line separation is also not an, an issue because of the monaural recording. There were no supplied dead cat filters or wind filters. The pop filters are adequate for uh, when there is no wind and you just want to use them I don't usually use them when they're on my person because the, the little styrofoam does tend to uh, brush against clothing and then you hear the, that sound. I checked the lapel microphones for the cardioid effect. Uh, there is a difference of only plus minus five decibels. This is still less than the human ear would uh, be able to perceive. Therefore, I give it a 10 out of 10 for the cardioid. Uh, for lack of cardioid, in fact, what you want is omnidirectional. And uh, of course, as omnidirectional mics, this is, uh, they do well. The headset mic is supposed to be cardioid, that is unidirectional, facing toward you. However, the test showed only a difference of plus minus four decibels between different directions. So this would be true omnidirectional. Since the headset mic is placed near the mouth, this would not make a real difference, therefore I'm not really giving it a rating. Nevertheless, you should be aware that this would make it more sensitive to ambient noise. For distance connect connectivity, as you saw in the earlier video just before this, this is where the unit really shines. There were very few drops right up to 100 meters or about 330 feet from the receiver even though its advertised line of sight rating is only 30 meters or about 100 feet. I've used much more expensive mics that could not do this. Some even closer, as, as close as five or six meters were dropping. Therefore, I give this a 10 out of 10 in this category. And this is the first time that I've given any wireless mic a rating of 10. So now in review, what do we have? Overall, the rating comes to 6.7 out of 10 on a weighted average, or 7 out of 10 in a split average, where performance and quality 
are given equal weight to the uh, physical qualities. This being said, if we count only the sound quality and reliability, we get a rating of 6.2. This rating and the previous two ratings do not include the headset mics. I would really like to get the company to improve the quality of, uh, of the supplied mics, first of all. So the quality of these microphones here, the Lavalier mics. And I would like to see improvement in the shielding of both the microphones and the transmitters. All in all, when used with the uh, lapel mics, I think the quality of the sound reproduction is adequate. The headset mics are a bit of a disappointment and too much like a telephone operator. If you're interested in this product, my suggestion would be to buy two real Lavalier mics and hook them up to uh, the transmitter. Doing that, uh, the HU25 at this time is available for about $70. You can get good quality Lavalier mics for about $20 a pair. So for $90, you could have a really good, reliable system, in my opinion. Hi. If you enjoyed what you saw in that video, then please click the subscribe button um, over here. Yeah, that one. Click the subscribe button, please. And whenever I put a video up, you will find out about it. Please.